Okay, so I just want to talk about, you know, what I wish I knew when I first started studying the Bible. It could also just be titled uh, How to Study the Bible, uh, whatever. But basically, I've been a Christian my whole life, and no one really has ever taught me how to study the Bible. I mean, I got serious about, like, God and everything, probably in junior high. I mean, I was always serious, but like in junior high, I was like, man, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I even had a, a guy take me under his wing as a mentor, and he, he would pray with me and read the Bible with me, and we do Bible studies together. But I never had it ever laid out exactly how to do a Bible study. Like, what is the best process? And so, um, and now in my life, I've got a bachelor's degree in Bible and theology. I am two classes away from finishing my master's degree in biblical languages and linguistics. Um, so I've been pursuing how to study the Bible for a while. And still, even in my undergrad, even in my master's course, no one has just laid out, here's what you do. I mean, there's been classes where you have to do a word study and this sort of stuff, but not like what I'm going to give you today. And I wish someone would just lay this out years ago for me and just boom, boom, boom. Here's the process. And this is in, and over time talking to people and engaging and reading books and commentaries and everything, you, uh, you learn to ask better questions. And that's a huge part of the process is learning what questions to ask and what are good questions. Um, so without further ado, here we go. So I've broken down into five steps, simple five steps. Um, and if you're an expert out there, maybe you have a different step or maybe you say a different order. Like that's not my point here is to like, uh, this is the dogmatic way to do it. This is just a good way to get going. And maybe you want to tweak this a little bit, go for it. Like, I don't really care. Just like if you have no method and no plan and your only plan is you just randomly open the Bible here and there and you just journal whatever thoughts come to you, like that's good, but there's a better way. So Hopefully this will help you go to the next level in studying the Bible and familiarizing yourself with it. So step one is familiarize yourself with the passage you're studying. Um, this should go without saying, but it has to be said. Reading one verse here and there uh, is not going to help you out in the long run. Um, you're not going to understand those verses in context. And outside of context, those verses, and this is people aren't going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyways, they have no meaning, right? Outside of context, they can mean anything you want them to mean, which means you're never going to hear what they actually mean and what God intended them to mean outside of the context. So you can't just read one verse and just take that and be like, hey, this is what God's saying. I, I just think that's a terrible plan. Like, I, I get we all do that. We have verses and like posters and stuff in our houses, but like, this is a better way. So what I think the best way to do, how to familiarize yourself with the passage um, is study a book of the Bible at a time and break it down into chunks, right? Break it down into logical chunks where you're hearing uh, the whole flow of thought of the author in that passage. And then as you start to break down those chunks, you start to understand and think what they're saying. Then you can think about how they all fit together and then you'll get a big picture of what the whole book of Matthew is like, right? Or whatever you're studying. Um, another thing you need to do is that you need to move when you're studying things from what is closest to the author to away from him. So what I mean by this is, let's say you're studying Ephesians 2, uh, 1 to 10 or something. So you're going to read Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 until you, you get so familiar with it, you know uh, how many times a certain word appears in that time and how many times that word appears in the rest of Ephesians. And so now you've got questions, and I'm just making this off the top of my head, but let's say the word righteousness shows up. Well, the way Paul uses righteousness might be different than the way Matthew uses righteousness. So before I jump to Matthew and I start making links in my head to verses in Matthew, I want to see every way Paul talks about it, right? Because he might even have nuanced meaning and different arguments for that word. So we need to start with Paul. What does Paul say? I need to start in the book of Ephesians closest to my passage and hear what he has to say there. Then I can go on. And if I'm going to look at the rest of the Pauline epistles, I'm going to start with the ones that are written closest in time, right? So if he wrote two letters in a prison cell at the same time, he wrote one to Timothy and one to Ephesus, completely making that up. Uh, that might be useful, right? I might get a little more insight because he's got the same state of mind when he's writing these things. Now, if he writes something 40 years later, 
that might have a big difference. His thought might have developed and morphed a little and he might have more meaning or nuance to it. So I want to know those things where I'm looking at it. And then I will look at other people outside of Paul. Then I'll look at the gospels. Then I'll look at what might have influenced Paul's writing in the old Testament, these types of things. But first I'm gonna start with Paul. All right. So you want to start nearest to your passage and move your way, uh, in time and in location, right? Because culture affects us and the place you're writing affects us. So start as close as you can and work on your way out from that passage. Um, you know, before I move on, the other thing that I would want to mention, the, the bummer with uh, quoting a verse out of context, usually when people do this, they're, what they mean or the interpretation they come to isn't heretical. Usually it is still a biblical idea. It's just not what that verse is saying. But the problem is now they think that's what that verse means. They never dig into that verse to find out what it truly does mean. So they never hear what God has to say from that verse truly because they've kind of like whitewashed over it, what it means. Um, so I have this other, I have this quote from C.S. Lewis. I'm going to read it to you. It's a, I just think it's awesome. It always helps me focus on what's important. Um, and he says this, he wrote, there's a strange idea that in every subject, the ancient books should be read only by the professionals and that the amateur should content himself with the modern books. Thus, I have found as a tutor in English, English literature that if the average student wants to find out something about Platonism, the very last thing he thinks of doing is to take a translation of Plato off the library shelf and read the symposium. He would rather read some dreary modern book 10 times as long, all about isms and influences, and only once in 12 pages telling him what Plato actually said. The error is rather an amiable one, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate and thinks he will not understand him. But if he only, the great man, just because of his greatness, is much more intelligible than his modern commentator, the simplest student will be able to understand, if not all, yet a very great deal of what Plato said. But hardly anyone can understand some modern books on Platonism. It has always therefore been one of my endeavors as a teacher to persuade the young that first-hand knowledge is not only more worth acquiring than the second-hand knowledge, but is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire." So I read that because the point is familiarize yourself with the Bible. Don't just listen to other people preaching sermons. Don't just listen to podcasts. Um, don't just watch YouTube. Don't just do all this other stuff. Know the Bible firsthand better than you know anything. Know that better first, and then you'll be able to sift through so many other thoughts, and you'll get insights all by yourself just because God's the one who's orchestrated this book on our behalf so that we could know him. He wants it to happen, so if you step into it, he's going to lead you into truth. All right, um, that's step one. More could be said, but let's move on. Uh, step two, write down all your thoughts, observations, and questions pertaining to the text. So when I'm going through it and I'm reading a text, if I see, I'm like, oh, I wonder if it's like this verse or something's flying in my head. That doesn't mean everything I write down is going to turn out to be true. I'm just writing down everything and it's giving me bunny trails to go travel down later, questions to go search to find out the answer to. So when I have a question, does that mean this? Is that just like this? I'll write it down. Or what does that word mean? Why does he use it so many times? I just write them all down and then it becomes my checklist, my punch list of things to go find out. Um, and I know I put this as step two, but you're going to be continuing to go through this and update it as you go through your studying times. So like my next step is commentaries. You're going to copy, right? What commentaries say. You find something you found interesting or helpful or insightful. You're going to put that into your notes, right? You're going to basically be building your own personal notes or commentaries on every book of the Bible you study. Um, so a uh, few tips on this for writing down your thoughts. Before you get to the commentaries, you want to have an opinion about what the text says, even if that opinion is wrong. What? Uh, no, the reason I think it gives your brain something to chew on, right? If you have an opinion, like for me, let's say eschatology. If I have an opinion, then I can retain better, or it's like it creates an area for information to store in my head. And so then I can chew on it and I can press, say, well, which argument's better? Is it this or is it that? 
And uh, because I have an opinion where if I have no opinion, it's like I find the information meaningless and my brain just doesn't retain it, right? It just doesn't keep it like, ah, uh, you have nothing. This is, so have an opinion about the text you're reading, even if it's wrong, be open to changing it, but start somewhere, right? If you're a Calvinist and you're looking at some text, start with that opinion. Like, does this verse, I think Calvinism is true. I'm going to go with this and then find out you think you're wrong. And so it gives you a dialogue in your head to engage with scripture. And that makes it root deeper inside of you and st- last longer. Um, and at this point, I have friends of mine that I even hear their voices, and their objections to my thoughts that I would have. And so I'm dialoguing with multiple partners in my head over the text and what it could mean. And I'm hearing their arguments and uh, it's just helpful for processing the scriptures and thinking about it thoroughly. Um, my other encouragement to you is, and I made up this number completely, right? This is not some technical number, but it feels like something like 80% of what I read in commentaries is just really good observations of the text that you don't need to have a PhD to make that conclusion. You could have seen that for yourself if you studied the text really well. And when I say study the text really well, I mean being uh, observant of repetition of words, uh, word plays, um, even shift from second person to third person. So the shift from saying you, you, you to them or they or something like that. Uh, so if you have a really detailed eye and you're reading the passage that goes back to step one, being familiar with the passage, uh, you can learn like, and I'm making this number up, but it feels like 80% of what commentaries say with no language background. You don't need to know Greek or Hebrew. You can make so many insights, especially if you're familiar with the Old Testament and it's just ingrained in you. And then you're reading the Old Testament and allusions are coming forward over and over. Uh, and there's always challenges. And there's things we misunderstand. And we're always having to readapt uh, our perspective on things uh, to grow in our understanding. But just by reading the Bible alone, you can know so much. You don't need a degree for that. Um, you just got to be a careful reader of the text. Uh, the other one that's cool is if you write down your thoughts and then you read a commentary and then you see, whoa, he said exactly what I said and he saw what I saw. That can build your confidence that you're not just a dummy, that you can do this. So I think that's another great thing about writing down because you're like, yeah, that feels good. And, and I have so many journals and things that I've kept that I look back on and I'm embarrassed. Like, I've thought about burning them. Like, I'm not showing them to anybody. I'm like, yeah, that Bible thought was wrong. You know what I mean? But then there's definitely been times where I had it. I'm like, wow, I found like a whole bunch of guys that came to the same conclusion I came to, but I came to it on my own. Uh, And that feels really good. And it builds your confidence and it makes you enjoy reading scripture too. So you want to do it more. Um, But just because, and I have to say this, just because you find a commentator who says what you think doesn't mean it's true. And I'm saying that to myself, just because I find a guy who uh, supports my claim doesn't make it truth. It just doesn't. So you have to be real with yourself, right? We're not just looking for people who pat us on the back and say, yeah, that's exactly right. No, we actually after truth. We actually want to find out what the text mean. Um, so I'm going on. So pursue all those uh, answers, all those questions you've written down and go for it. So step three, read some commentaries, right? Um, I'm going to read you a quote here, and it says, sound like it's saying the opposite of what C.S. Lewis said, but I think it's a matter of order. Do the C.S. Lewis thing first. Be familiar with that literature first. Don't think you can't read it. Read it for yourself, and then jump into this quote. And this is from uh, Charles Spurgeon, and it's his advice to novice preachers. Uh, He said, in order to be able to expound the scriptures and as an aid to your pulpit studies, you will need to be familiar with the commentators, a glorious army, let me tell you whose acquaintance will be your delight and profit. Of course, you are not such wiseacres as to think or say that you can expound scripture without assistance from the works of divines and learned men who have labored before you in the field of exposition. A respectable acquaintance with the opinion of the giants of the past might have saved many an erratic thinker from wild interpretations and outrageous inferences. Usually we have found the despisers of commentaries, men who have no sort of acquaintance with them in their case it is the opposite of familiarity which has bred contempt um so he's just saying hey man like the holy spirit and i'm adding this uh he's taught other people the scriptures and we can learn from them it's not a solo gig god delights 
in teaching other through others. And so commentators are some of those. And God will give us true and real insight by reading them. So if we cast off everybody who ever came before us and pretty much like they have no insight whatsoever to give, I think that's a very uh, dangerous position to be in. It's very arrogant, too, to think that God only shows you truth and he hasn't showed anybody for the last 2,000 years since Jesus any insight into Scripture. That's ridiculous, right? So benefit from them. Doesn't mean everything's true. We still have to, like sort through this stuff, but, uh, God has been speaking to more people than just you and me. All right. Um, one of the bummers though with commentaries is that they don't always have the answer to your question. And there's different types of commentaries. Um, and one of the things, uh, uh, another benefit from the commentaries is that they can introduce you to relevant ancient literature. Right, and you might be like, "What's ancient literature?" Like, well, guys like Josephus and the the Mishnah, the Talmuds, and if that's like foreign language to you that I just said, like, bear with me, we're going to get there. Uh, but they can introduce you to some of that, and they can point you in the direction to further study, which is really benefit, especially when you're starting out because you don't know where to go, you don't know what to look for, so they can help you out. Um, but go ahead and fact check them, right? Like, they're not infallible, and sometimes they don't do uh, all the background work they should have done and they will misquote things. So go ahead and fact check them, make sure they're doing it right. So commentaries. Uh, commentaries that I recommend. Um, so there's literally a website um, called bestcommentaries.com and it has commentaries listed for every book of the Bible, uh, listing in order of the highest rated. So if you're looking for a book, a commentary on Job, you can just type in Job, find what is recommended as the highest rated commentaries. And it even breaks down commentaries by different types of genres that they've thought of, pastoral, uh, I don't, technical, I don't know if they have exegetical or whatever. But um, So now what you do have to think about with that is how are they coming to those ratings? Um, and, and this is straight from their website and you can look it up because I was curious that how do you get those ratings? So uh, the way they rate it is based on these four criteria. One, they say the average rating from journals and users. Now, if you don't know what a journal is, I don't fault you, right? Only like real scholar nerds are reading Bible journals. I don't know even how they stay making money, but somehow they're out there. And what happens is scholars write articles, they get put in these journals and maybe some other scholars read it if they're lucky. Um, so they're saying that some journal has rated this scholar, uh, rated this commentary and that gave it some points. Uh, their second criteria says the total number of reviews. Now, I don't know if they're looking at like amazon.com or where they're looking at reviews, but total number of reviews. So if it was on, let's pretend it's Amazon, and this one commentary had 10,000 reviews and this other one had two, the 10,000 reviewed commentary is gonna be higher ranking. They say C, this is their third criteria they use. They say internal modifier. For some reviewers, a behind the scenes modifier may be added that will give their reviews more or less weight. The reason for this is to be able to give more weight to credible academic sources that may not have many reviews. So what I imagine is going on here is they know of some academic scholars and they're saying we're gonna, what you rate higher, we're gonna give more points to. We're gonna push it up higher because you might know about resources that the average Joe doesn't know about and it's not getting reviewed a lot. So we're gonna push that to the top. And then their fourth one is libraries. They say libraries are curated list of books and being included in a library increases the book's overall rating. Uh, I don't know where they're pulling that from, but that's the four criteria they give, how they base it. Now, the algorithm isn't perfect. Unknown gems can be missed and popularity isn't the test of that which is most true, right? So just because this is the most popular commentary doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't, definitely doesn't mean that everything it says in that commentary is true either. So you just got to have that in your mind or it just means it's highly popular. A lot of people have liked it and they recommended it, right? Um, there might be something better hidden in the the halls of some ancient monastery in Israel somewhere that's gold, you know, who knows? Uh, it could be out there. Um, so here's some of my favorites. Now it's might be a weird list. Some of you guys who are like commentary experts out there, connoisseurs, uh, but this is what I like. Uh, and most people say don't buy whole series. I'm a collector. So I'm like, heck yeah, I'll buy a whole series. Cause I want to get them all right. Like Pokemon or something. Uh, but 
I really like an exegetical summary series. Um, what I like about it is that it will go line by line through the text and it'll present to you uh, questions about the text. Does it mean this or does it mean that uh, when it finds the ambiguities and things like this? And then they'll list the answers that are given to that question and they'll cite which commentary side on which side. So it gives me a quick look of difficult decisions they're going to have to do with the text and how they're answered and who answers them that way. And then I can go look at those commentaries for further study. So it's always one of the ones I have open on my Bible program that I'm looking at. Um, other ones that I really like, but this is just because I'm into like trying to learn languages better, the biblical languages. But I really like the exegetical guide to the Greek New Testament. And I always look, I don't always like, but I'll look at the NGTC and the ICC. Yes, there's a lot of acronyms when it comes to commentaries. You just got to get used to it. Um, another one I do like, um, it is, let me see if I can find it really fast. And I think this would be a really good commentary for, uh, especially if you're first getting in, the NIV application commentary series. I actually find theirs really good. It seems like that's like your beginner one, but a lot of times I end up liking what it says. Um, so there you go. Some options for you. Uh, lastly, buy some of these. Don't be cheap. Just get them. I mean, you know, you're wasting money on a thousand other things. Buy some commentaries, get two of them, at least for each book of the Bible. Uh, and then don't think about it. All right. Step four. So now we're on step four. Lexicons and language tools. Now, lexicon is just a fancy word for a dictionary. Usually when you say lexicon, somebody's referring to a dictionary of Greek words or Hebrew words. Um, but that's all that means in language tools. Sometimes when you study a passage, you're going to want to look at the meaning of a word. Now, there is a plethora of fallacies that can happen when you're studying a word individually. But once again, back to that context thing, context is king. Words don't have meaning. And now this was a, a thought I struggled with when I first heard it, but I've come to really believe it. Words don't have meaning outside of context. You're like, what? But well, if I say tree, you know exactly what I'm thinking, but what tree? And what about the tree? And even in the Bible, they use the word tree for a cross. So like words don't have meaning except for in context. Um, just, Chew on that for a bit. Um, a good way, if you're not a language person, you're going to deal with this. If you have a whole bunch of Bible translations, and you can look at these on free websites like blueletterbible.com. Yeah, that was an alarm. So you can look at these on free websites called blueletterbible.com, uh, and they will show you multiple translations. Now, let's say you look up, I don't know, First John 1. And you read it in eight different translations. And they all say almost word for word the exact same things. You can be pretty confident that that is a solid um, translation. And that there's nothing tricky going on in the underlying Greek. Now, if you look up eight translations, they all have radically different translations. That's a good indication that something weird is going on in the original language that's making it difficult for people to all come in agreement with right? There's some ambiguity in the text or syntax could be read this way or that way. Uh, that's a clue. So then you're going to, if you don't know language, you're going to have to get some help there uh, through a commentary. Uh, when it comes to lexicons or dictionaries that are best, uh, generally it's considered the BDAG. That's an acronym of the editors of this Greek lexicon, B-D-A-G. Uh, that's generally referred to as the best one. Now, when it comes to dictionaries, it matters the era they're studying the words. If you go 200 years before Jesus and before Paul and studying Greek words, they might mean something radically different than they mean in the time of Jesus and Paul. So if you, whatever dictionary you get, you got to know that it's dealing with words at the time of Jesus and the apostles. You cannot be dealing with words before or after because it may not bear that same meaning in those time periods. Because uh, words, their meaning changes over time. Um, a good example of this is in... Uh, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, uh, we all know this, well, most of us know this, Juliet cries out, she says, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And it sounds like to modern day English here, she's asking, where is Romeo? Where are you, Romeo? But she isn't. She's not asking where he is. She's asking, why do you have to be Romeo? 
because there's beef between their families and she's saying, why do you have to be of that family? Cause now we can't be together because our families hate each other. So that's just an example of how words change. Another one is the word nice. It used to mean stupid, right? Like that is so different than it's meaning today, right? We don't, if you don't go around and call people nice and no one's punching you for it. So, uh, for the Hebrew and Aramaic, the dictionary that's most referred to is the, the halo. I don't know if that's how you say it, but it's H A L O T. So that's one. Um, now this goes into language studies. This is a, a dictionary of sorts. It's by Moises Silva. That's M O I S E S Silva. And it's called now, if you like acronyms, this is a, a mother of all acronyms when it comes to biblical studies, but, uh, the new international dictionary of new Testament theology and exegesis. So N I D N T T E, uh, but Moises Silva is a really good biblical scholar and linguist kind of guy at the same time. So he does word studies in there and his is really good. I don't think there's one better than that. If you're going to like do a word study, read through his stuff. Um, that'll help you out. Da -da 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 -da. Now, one more thing when it comes to lexicons and language tools to note here is that the trans there's a translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Uh, many times you'll see this reference with uh, the Roman numerals for numbers, right? Roman numerals, but that looks like LXX and that's 70. Uh, and there's this, this ancient story that goes with it that back sometime after Babylonian exile or something the some rabbis or whatever got together and they're like, Hey, we need to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Cause that's what everybody's reading these days. So 70 something guys went away with their own copy of the Hebrew manuscript and they all translated into Greek and they all came back and they compared and everybody's was exactly the same. And so that's how they got the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the old Testament a few hundred years before Jesus, something like that. All right now, probably a fictional story. Maybe there's some truth to it. Um, but that's it. Now that can be helpful because in the new Testament, uh, it gets quoted more than the Hebrew old Testament does. So the Septuagint, and I'm like 90% sure that's true. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure I read a book on it. Uh, so fact check me. Um, but they quote it often and they quote the Septuagint. So if I'm looking at Paul and he's using a word, his, his, uh, what has created the meaning behind that word that he's using might have come from the way it was used in the Septuagint. So I need to look at that and see how he it was used there because it might be impacting the way Paul is now using it uh, in his context. So something to look at. Um, all right, step five, last step, and we're done. Uh, read background literature of the Bible. So there's a whole corpus of ancient books written thousands of years ago that give us insight into Scripture. Uh, this is probably the hardest one to get into when you start saying the Bible yourself because it's just it's massive and you don't know where to start and you don't know which ones, uh, what type of literature is helpful in what way. So I, I have this broken down and I didn't come up with this. I actually, uh, I mean, some of these I was aware of, I know, but a lot of this I'm taking from Interpreting the New Testament Text and Introduction to the Art and Science of Exegesis by Daryl L. Bach and Boost M. Fanning. Yeah, I don't know how to say that name. So here we go. So you're going to want to go through these to study scripture. You want to familiarize yourself with these ancient literature. Now, you don't have to read all. I don't think anybody's read it all. It's just ginormous, right? Uh, but guys have. And you want to start reading some of the more important works in each of these genres that I'm going to list here below. And they'll help you. And you'll have your firsthand knowledge, just like C.S. Lewis said. Read it for yourself. Don't just hear the commentator talk about it. Go read what the commentator is quoting from for yourself. Um, so the first category, uh, and there's, I have this broken down into five categories here, but do it however you like. Historical works. So there's a whole bunch of ancient body of literature that's historical works, and these give us the basic chronology events and people of the biblical times. All right, number two, uh, pre, I call it prerequisite works. That just means they're like before. These are writings that precede the time of the biblical writings and may have been known to the authors of the biblical text and thus perhaps had an influence on the writings, right? So these were written before Paul, whoever we're reading, I'm just using Paul as an example because it's easy, and he might have read them. So they might influence his thoughts. So we want to be familiar with them because when he has a concept 
maybe he's drawing straight from that concept. Um, another one would be contemporaneous works. So works that are around at the same time as them, right? Because uh, they might be dialoguing with them. They might be uh, arguing against an idea that's been written about in their time. So we want to familiarize ourselves with that. It gives us uh, a lot of the letters. I don't know if I've heard this analogy before, but they're like one-sided telephone calls. We read Paul's letter. We're getting one side of the story, but maybe one of these other works will give us a little insight to why he's saying what he's saying. Um, but they also give us context and insight into the worldview and the culture of the time. Um, and different people groups and how they're interacting. It just helps because in my what I'm doing with a lot of this stuff is I'm building what the ancient world looked like in my head. So when I read the Bible, I'm jumping into that world and reading it there then, how that was. Uh, the third category I have here is later non-biblical related works. So these can help us reconstruct. The, they're not going to help us with understanding ideas in the Bible, uh, per se, like theological ideas, but they're going to help us with, you know, was it easy to go get water? Did you plant crops? I mean, what did they think of the seasons? Did they think there was many gods or their temples? What did they do in their worshiping their temples? Did everybody have to? This kind of stuff or the history and uh, that kind of stuff. The last category is later biblical related works. These can sometimes maintain traditions. So something's written after the biblical period, right? It depends what biblical period we're talking about, but it's written afterwards. And sometimes they maintain the traditions and the understandings that were around in the biblical time. Even though it's 100, 200 years later, it can preserve for us what they might have thought and how they acted and maybe even understood biblical texts at the time of the writing of the Bible, right? Which the Bible was written over thousands of years, so you uh, understand that in context. Um, now, it's important to note that prerequisite, so that was my number two category and my number three category, contemporaneous works, these have the most direct bearing on the meaning of a biblical author's text, right? So there's a, the most important, if you will, um, but there you have it. Uh, so if you're like, I'm lost, well, you just, wow. Uh, the best book, there's a couple books I'm going to recommend here that are good for giving you a guide in this. So I feel like seminaries, Bible colleges, they should like require to get these and go through them and read some of this stuff to start getting you familiar with it. Uh, but they're called the ancient text for the study of the Hebrew Bible by Kenton L. Sparks. And the second one is basically just like it. It's ancient text for the New Testament studies by Craig A. Evans. Uh, what's cool about these books is that they list all of the relevant literature. They list it all and they give little summaries, right? So it's giant. They don't contain it all, but they list it and tell you a little bit about it. Um, whether it's the Mishnah, the Talmud, or the Apostolic Fathers, they're listed in there with a the summary. Uh, so go get on Amazon, buy these, purchase them. So, but obviously I'm going to say this, this should go without saying, but the Old, the Old Testament is the primary literature you need to be familiar with when reading the New Testament, right? Uh, how it shaped the way Jesus and the apostles thought. What was Judaism really like, right? Not just a character that we might have in the Western church. All right, so I'm going to give you a brief summary of the most important background literature for biblical studies, right? This is a brief summary so that you can get your idea of what is out there. So, one category, and once again, you can break this up however you want, right? And some of these categories overlap, so don't get real critical here, but uh, Old Testament Apocrypha and Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, all right? So these are completed before the first century. Uh, some of them are such as Syriac, um, Psalms of Solomon, First and Second Maccabees um, are part of the Old Testament Apocrypha. Uh, there's no clear count for some of these. Uh, maybe 65 to 85 works of these. Um, and Pseudepigrapha, they're written under the name of another person, um, such as Jude for, I mean, such as Enoch, but Jude, Jude verse 14, it quotes First Enoch 1, 9 in the Bible. So you, that just gives you an idea how important some of these are. The biblical authors are quoting them. Uh, so they read them a lot. They were really familiar with them. So it would help us if we were too. And they assumed a lot of their people were familiar with them, who they're talking with. Um, so back to the pseudepigrapha. That means this written, it's a, a book or a letter written with a false name. 
Now the question becomes, wow, that makes them like a liar. That's like really bad. Well, maybe not. Sometimes you did that to give like, like credence to that person or make it seem more important. Um, say this is so important as if Enoch wrote it, you know what I mean? Or something like that. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how that was perceived, but there's a lot of them and they quote from them. So I don't think they took it as a negative. We have a different perspective today in our time. Uh, B, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So most people know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, but if you don't, here you go. You're welcome. It's a collection of books found by the Dead Seas in like the early 1900s, 1940s, or something like that. Uh, there was a group of Jews who lived there in Jesus' time called the Essenes, and they basically cast shade a giant library in, in clay jars, and it's so dry out there that they didn't get ruined for 2,000 years. And that library could be older than that. And those books could be older than that time. That's just when they were last put in a jar was in Jesus' time. Uh, this group, the Essenes, were stricter than the Pharisees. And they lived out there waiting for the day, uh, the judgment day, basically, when the Messiah would come and judge all the nations. Uh, so they had a whole bunch of the writings. They had the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, the Secretarian writings, and more. Uh, they give us what's really important about them is that they confirm the, the biblical text that we have, that it hasn't changed. But secondly, they give us a glimpse into it, what a Jewish community looked like at the time of Jesus. Though one group, right? But they give us an idea uh, what was going on in that world. It gives us a, it creates that picture of the ancient world for us, helps us craft that in our head. Um, other people, Philo. So this is a Jew who wrote just before the writings of the New Testament were composed, and he lived at the same time as those in the New Testament. Uh, his writings are highly allegorical uh, and kind of hard to understand, but he's important to read. I personally haven't read a ton of his stuff, um, but everybody quote everybody says you got to. So there you go. Now Josephus, here's a guy I have read, uh, not everything, but a large majority of what he's written that we have. That's the antiquity of the Jews and his Jewish war. That's the one I've spent more time in. The antiquity of the Jews, basically like a retelling of the Bible from what I've read um, in his words. But it's really important historical because he tells us what happens leading up to the Jewish war and how they lost the war and all the infighting that went on between the Jews and its eventual the downfall of Jerusalem. Uh, really, definitely worth reading. You should read it, um, Josephus. Uh, Greco-Roman, oh, before I move on that, Josephus, he was a Jew. He was a military leader who got captured by the Romans. Some of the Jews might say he was a traitor because then he helped them and he tried to get his fellow Jewish people to stop fighting the Romans. Uh, that's kind of his story. Um, there's a guy, I listened to a book called Traitors about Josephus and Jewish 78 war. Really good. I think it's on Audible. Uh, good listen. All right, next category, Greco-Roman literature. Now, there's a huge corpus of literature here. And what's important about it is that, once again, it helps us understand that world, mostly to those who are Paul's ministering to in the Roman areas in the world, right? Not so helpful for areas that aren't Roman occupied or something like that, but what their gods are like, how they think, how their worldview is. So guys like this would be Homer, Herodotus, uh, Thucydides, Tacitus, Plutarch, blah, blah, blah. And there's a probably a thousand more that I don't know about. Um, now, now we're going to get into rabbinic works that are helpful for studying the Bible as, as far as it goes with ancient uh, literature outside of the Bible. Uh, first one I have listed here is Targums. Uh, it's a rabbinic work. It's a paraphrases. So it's not quite a translation. Uh, it's a paraphrase of the Old Testament in Aramaic. Uh, why that's helpful is because they, in, when they, paraphrase it they put some of their ideas into it how they understood it which can give us insight into how uh the old testament was understood by those in the time of jesus right um it was written in the second century but it's still those ideas and how it's perceived were probably still there in the second century of how it was in the first century right the farther we get away the more skeptical we have to become to say did those traditions were they still viewed the same way but so the next one is the Mishnah. It's a, also a rabbinic work. It's a collection of oral tradition. Uh, it's basically the written down oral law, right? Uh, generally, it contained commentary on the practices of the Torah. And now this can be insightful because I have a, a quote here um, from that, 
that book I mentioned earlier, Interpreting the New Testament Text. And he says, for example, if the capital trial information provided by the Mishnah can be assumed to describe first century practices, Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin was riddled with violations. Capital cases were to be tried during the day. A verdict of conviction could not be reached until the following day, and because guilty verdicts needed a second day, trials could not be held the eve of a festival day or Sabbath. Now, if you know anything about when Jesus was crucified, they just violated a whole bunch of stuff. That tells us, that, so if we're assuming that's true, the Mishnah helps us say, man, those are some shady dudes pulling some shady stuff. They weren't doing things good. Um, so it can help us. The Talmuds, that's the next category, Talmuds, rabbinic work. Now, there's two of these. There's the Palestinian and the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, the Babylonian is generally considered as more important. Uh, these were completed around 400 AD and 600 AD, and they give a commentary of the Mishnah. So it gives us more insight in how people were thinking about all this, which helps us create that uh, ancient world in our mind and what it was like and how they were thinking. Um, so that's the Talmuds. Now, the last rabbinic work I'm going to mention here is the Midrash. Um, this is a commentary or rewriting of the Old Testament starting in 380. All these rabbinic works contain traditions from the first century. Though not everything might be from the first century. So we got to read it a little careful, but it can give us insight. Now, I'm going to mention another book here that was probably worth getting to help sort through what would have been in the first century and what wasn't. Um, a guy named David Instone Brewer, he's writing a series on this, and it's called Traditions of the Rabbis from the Era of the New Testament. So those would probably be great books to pick up, um, read through. I haven't read them. I don't think he's completed the series. I think there's a couple that are out, maybe the first volume and the part one of the second volume. So that's not confusing. So uh, next we have the Apostolic Fathers. These are written by Christians uh, just after the time of the apostles, with the exception of the Didache, which was likely written um, before maybe the last couple books of the Bible were written of the New Testament. Um, they give us insight into how the first Christians understood uh, Scripture and Jesus and all that went on at that time. So it's a perspective of Christians uh, just after the time of the apostles. Now, when I first started reading the Apostolic Fathers, this is probably the category I've read the most of, I thought it was going to be like a slam dunk on all biblical theological arguments. Oh, man, the earliest guys, they know what they're talking about. But one of the things that happens very quickly is that the leadership of the church, which was primarily Jewish with Jesus and the apostles, quickly becomes uh, Greek, right? Um, and they're going to reject Judaism at some level. And so we lose some of that Jewish perspective that they have. And so just you got to read it with a grain of salt, and you can't just take everything you read in it to the bank. But it does, once again, gives us insight into the early church and how they thought and how they were thinking. Um, that was discouraging to me at first, realizing, like, whoa, there's some weird stuff in here, stuff that nobody today who's a Christian really abides by or believes or thinks of. I mean, I think the shepherd of Hermas, however you say that, he talks about the phoenix as if it was real and how it lives for 500 years and then dies and a worm grows out of its ashes and becomes another phoenix. And and he talks of it like it was a real creature. Maybe it was, maybe it will, I don't know. It's just, there you go. That, that's the apostolic fathers for you. Um, and then there's also an, the, another category called the New Testament Apocrypha. These aren't as helpful, but can once again show ideas and opposing ideas to orthodox teaching in the time of the early church. All right, uh, Gnostic literature. Uh, Gnosticism was a pseudo-Christian idea in the early church that was combated by those who are considered um, orthodox. And so understanding their literature can give us insight um, into how not to think about Christianity, basically. Um, so now I do want to say this. So that was a big list. It's overwhelming. I get it. It's a lot. You don't have to be an expert in all this. I'm just pointing out the different categories. So when you start to study, you start going down some of these rabbit holes. You start, hey, I'm going to look at the Mishnah. I'm going to look at the Talmuds. I'm going to I'm going to incorporate this. I'm aware that it's out there. And it also tempers us when we're reading the scriptures that we think, there's a lot of other stuff out there and I don't know it all. So maybe I'm going to be a little less dogmatic about my opinion right now. I'm going to be a little, I'm going to go read some of this before I start, you know, burning the bridges with everybody who doesn't agree with me on this. 
Um, so you don't have to read all this to be an expert, right? You don't have to read all these to study the Bible. This isn't meant to be a list that discourages you. Uh, it's just meant to be a resource to point you in the right direction. Um, so uh, along that idea of growing in confidence, I think the way we grow in confidence over what a scriptural text means when we're studying the Bible is we get an idea. Uh, and I heard someone say, don't be an expert in something you've only known about for five minutes, right? So we had an idea. We think the text means this. Well, what we do is we then start reading more and more of the Bible. And if that idea still holds up, we're like, okay, nothing I've come across in the Bible is really shutting it down, obviously. Okay. Then we, we talk about that with some friends who are smarter than us. And if they are like, they don't shut it down, then we're like, okay, maybe this has some merit. Then we start reading some of that ancient literature and some commentaries. And we start to say, you know what? The more I'm chewing on this, and I'm talking like years, I grow more and more confident that my understanding is right. So the more it gets tested, the more confident I get if it withstands that testing. If it hasn't been tested and I haven't prayed over it, read lots of scripture, thought about it, chewed on it, processed it, I'm not going to be super dogmatic about it. I don't think that's wise. So you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be super dogmatic about something you just came up with. And here's the other one. Every idea you have about scripture is not going to be true. Right? And this is hard. I come from the charismatic community, if you will. And this is really hard for us because we're like, man, God spoke to me. I just had revelation and insight and oh, it's so good. And then we start to study out and find out it was wrong and it was just us and it wasn't God. That's really hard to admit. That's really hard, especially if we make like God gave me this insight. We start throwing God around in it. All of a sudden we're like, oh, I can't take it back because it was God. And I'm committed to this idea that's actually not true now because I said it was God. So just don't do that. Go slow and say, I, this might be wrong. I'm willing. I'm going to change this. I, I, there's a lot of me in my thinking. It's not all God. So every thought I have about the Bible isn't guaranteed to be true. Probably most of them aren't. So hold them lightly. Um, all right. A few other tips and then we'll be done. So just some random thoughts here. I'll give you a few. All right. A thousand bad arguments about what a text means doesn't make it true. Sometimes I feel like this is the tactic of people trying to persuade uh, us on their opinion of whatever it is. Instead, because they have no good argument, they'll throw out a thousand little arguments that we say, no, that's a bad, that doesn't count, that doesn't count. But because they've bombarded us with a thousand of them, we're like, wow, maybe, maybe their argument's true because they have a thousand bad arguments. No, it's not true. There could be one good argument that outweighs a thousand bad arguments, right? So I guess I did that backwards. But... So you have to judge each argument on its own merit. Now, on top of that means you can't trust the argument just because of the person who's giving it. So you love John Piper. John Piper said it must be true. You can't do that. You got to judge your argument on the argument. You love, uh, I don't know, whoever it is, Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, whoever. Those are the charismatic guys I know. Uh, you love it just because they said it and you respect them and they're the most Christian person ever doesn't make their argument true. Like, that's really hard for us too. Like, but this guy's the best guy ever. He's been more Christian than never sinned ever, blah, 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 a thousand things. He gives every penny he has away. His idea of what scripture might mean can still be wrong. And that's really tough. And then someone who's a jerk and not good and bad, they might actually understand scripture correctly. So you got to judge the arguments on their own merit. And that's really tough. Um, and then along with this, every argument doesn't have the same weight. Some arguments are more important than other ones, right? Um, and sometimes we have a high likelihood of what a text means, but we don't have good evidence for it. And the opposite can be true too. Sometimes we have lots of evidence that suggests it means this way, but the likelihood is not true. So you have to use, still use logic. Our God-given human reasoning is not evil in this sense, right? Uh, normal logic is not the enemy. So, I mean, this is dumb, but... Like in my backyard, which is over here to the side, we have a tree in our backyard. We have many trees. Just because I have a tree in my backyard doesn't mean that every person in the world has a tree in their backyard, right? That's bad logic. Just because I saw a tree in my backyard doesn't mean my neighbor has a tree in his backyard, right? So we have to use simple logic like that when we read a text. Well, just because he says this doesn't mean it always ends up like this, right? Um, what do we call that? Um, 
correlation does not equal causation a lot of times. Just because I saw this word in this passage and that meant this doesn't mean every time that word shows up again, it means that same exact thing somewhere else, right? Correlation doesn't equal causation, blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of other logic things. It's not a lesson in logic. I couldn't even teach you that. But I know some people, sometimes they treat the Bible like it's like a, some magical text where all normal human reasoning goes out the door. I think that's a bad plan. We don't do that with anything else, right? So all of a sudden, the Bible is just like, it becomes whatever we want it to mean, right? And it's not a Bible code. There's not like some secret code you have to understand to get the meaning out of it, right? Normal logic. Um, so that's it. And so I'm just going to summarize the steps again, because by now you're like, whoa, I didn't remember this was like five steps. Uh, step one, familiarize yourself with the passage. Uh, step two, write down your thoughts, observations, and questions. Step three, read some commentary. Step four, use lexicon and language tools <clears throat> as necessary. Uh, step five, look at the relevant ancient literature of the time. And I'm sure I've missed something and there's things you'd want to add. Go ahead, do it. Like this wasn't meant to be the only way or the best way. It's just meant to be a good way for those who are starting out who don't know what to do. Um, all right. Thank you. We'll see you guys later. Bye.